In the last episode of Because Science, we were talking all about acceleration. We were wondering what different kinds of acceleration would do to the human body. But what I'm interested in today for this live episode, at least to start off, is what is the highest acceleration for any biological thing, period? Well, it is this. Do you know what this is? No, it's not what face huggers are held in before they hug your face. No, this is the nematocyst. This is the stinging cell that is in the jellyfish tentacle. And it looks kind of like this. It looks like a cell that holds inside of it a barbed harpoon filled with poison, actually venom. So it has a trigger on the outside, kind of like a face hugger uh, hole. And <laughs> if you touch this trigger, it sends out the barbed harpoon, it's inverted, and then it unfurls itself, like in, it goes, it, it like, it's like turning a glove inside out. And it inverts itself and it launches out until it extends all the way, and all these are backwards facing barbs so they stay in your skin, and then venom comes out the top and does bad things to fish, and pretty bad things to you, depending on what you are stung by. Now, when you touch this trigger on the outside of the cell that triggers the harpoon to launch, it will respond in just 700 billionths of a second. 700 nanoseconds. And to put that in context, uh, light only travels 700 feet in that time. If you know how fast light goes, and it's the fastest thing, you know how impressive that is. So in just 700 nanoseconds, this nematocyst will trigger. And it will get up to 18.6 meters per second in 700 nanoseconds. Now, if you do the math, that is an acceleration of 54. Nope. <laughs> 5.4 million Gs. This is pretty much the highest acceleration for any biological thing that we know of. Uh, the only thing that comes close to this, uh, physically speaking, the next uh, highest acceleration up on this list, if you were to list the highest accelerations of things that we know, is like the surface gravity of a neutron star. Yeah, jellyfish stinging cells are in the neighborhood of that. And they, they're extremely uh, impressive and effective. And now, you know because you are watching Because Science Live, the live edition of Because Science, where I take all of your nerdy comments, questions, and corrections, and comments about my appearance and voice, and address them directly off the top of my head. And look, I don't know everything. I'm often wrong. That's why I have an entire show called Footnotes, where I try to address those things. But I'm not always right, but I know a little bit about quite a lot of stuff in the science and sci-fi and pop culture realm, so consider me your nerdy conduit to these things, and I'm taking your questions from the chat, and we will get to them as best as I can. But if I don't know it, I don't know it. <laughs> Nate. Nate? Yep, I'm here. Nate. Yep. What is, here doesn't help me. I'm here. Okay, sure. Okay, what, what do we got? What are the nerds saying? Uh, from Connor. Hello, Connor. What would happen if the moon were to start plummeting, plummeting down to Earth suddenly? Uh, plummeting down to Earth suddenly. Well, uh, from our uh, Majora's Mask episode, we know that if you stop the moon in its orbit, it would take just, I, th I forget the exact number, but it's a little over four days to crash down on the Earth's surface. And that's because just the gravitational attraction between the two bodies. And it will start slow, but it will accelerate, accelerate, accelerate. And within four days, the moon would smash down on Earth. When that happened, hmm, that'd be a very complicated process. Um, it would probably cross the, you know, right before the moon hits the Earth, it will be traveling, it will, it will already have traveled most of this time. So by the time it gets to the Earth, it will be going very, 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 very fast. Um, and what would happen probably in that scenario, I don't know how long it would take, and um, I can't calculate off the top of my head what just the kinetic energy would be. It would be the mass of the moon and whatever its final velocity is, which I don't know. But what I do know is that you'd probably get something, this is what the moon looks like, you'd probably get something similar to what you see, I mean, at least visually, if I had to guess, you would get something similar to what you see uh, in Independence Day, which is an incredible fireball. Uh, Oh, Got to be accurate with how temperature from radiating black bodies go. Uh, it would be an incredible uh, 
fireball and shockwave and big cloud of bad thing heading your way. Uh, and it would, um, burn, it would attempt to burn itself up in the atmosphere because when you're going fast, like Mach 25, uh, then you're compressing the air in front of you enough that it heats up and it can start to turn the surface layer of the moon into a nice plasma and that's going to emit light and heat and this is going to be one big uh, fireball that most of the mass ma most of the mass of the moon makes it all the way through to the ground and the impact energy is going to be enormous i believe the moon the moon would probably be the biggest thing to ever impact the earth except for the thing that created mo the moon which scientists now think is a mars sized object but that was a long time ago uh, this would be the second biggest thing behind that, way bigger than what killed the dinosaurs, and that would be an impact large enough, I think, depending on what its final velocity is, you'd have to check uh, to see how quick it is, but depending, it would probably be an extinction level event. A mass extinction, if not all life, well, it would cause a lot of problems for most of it. Um, you've seen just how much a single volcano going off can disrupt air travel, for example, and that's just a single volcano. Imagine an impact uh, large enough that it threw, you know, a continent's worth of dirt into the air for a year. <laughs> that would really mess stuff up. Um, that would probably be the end of us. So thanks for getting me to think about that, Connor, if that was this commenter's name. It would be bad. What's next? From Chaos Genie. Ooh, don't rub him. Don't know what will happen. <laughs> I'm sorry. What's next? Well, sorry. I mean, what does he say? Or who, she? Who is your favorite planeswalker in Magic the Gathering, either in game or in lore? Wow. So if you don't know, I am also a huge Magic the Gathering nerd in addition to a science nerd. I've been playing since I was, wow. 10 or so, or 11. So I've been playing uh, almost um, 20 years for a, for a very long time. And uh, if you want to watch me play Magic uh, on the internet, you can go to the Command Zone, uh, where I did one of their gameplay videos called Game Nights. I love all those guys over there. We play even offline. I, I, I love them. Uh, and they're super nice and really, really good players. I've also played on Geek and Sundry, uh, on Spell Slingers, and uh, How to Play. Uh, so you can check those videos out if you want to. But I'm a huge Magic the Gathering nerd. What is my favorite Planeswalker? Hmm. I don't know. I have... Hmm. I, I have a soft spot for, I have a soft spot for uh, Nicol Bolas Planeswalker, not God Pharaoh, just Nicol Bolas Planeswalker, um, because it was one of the first Planeswalkers that I think I, I got in a dual deck and I played with my brother and I got it out, and uh, it's so oppressive if you have no way to deal with it that it's absolutely game ending, and I just I love that's why I love playing Commander. It's my main format. I love playing Commander because you get the you get to play these big, ridiculous spells that you don't get to play anywhere else, like Modern or Legacy or anything like that. Um, so I would go with Nicol Bolas. Also, uh, I think he has the coolest iterations of Planeswalkers over the years, from the new Flip Planeswalker in the last core set and stuff. So uh, let's go with Bolas. But I, I uh, second, uh, let's, let's go Narset, I think. I have a Narset deck that I like quite a bit, because it's mean. A lot of my decks are mean. I, don't, I wonder if that reflects on me. Who could say? What's next? From Christopher Cautious. Ooh, oh. I don't know what that reaction was, but ooh, oh, okay. <laughs> Here we go. What Can you, you give me some sweet rock climbing tips and then explain the science behind them? Okay, so this is a lot about my life. Uh, so uh, in addition to being a science nerd and a <laughs> Magic the Gathering nerd, I'm a big rock climbing nerd. Um, I've been climbing probably twice a week for the last 11 years every week straight. Um, so I've been climbing for a long, 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 long time. And uh, if I had any tips, it would be to just uh, get the mileage in, so to speak. So um, getting your body physiologically adapted to what you're doing takes a long time. And when you're starting out in rock climbing, uh, your, your forearms will have a hard time, your uh, muscles, uh, especially your pulling muscles will have a, uh, a hard time. And uh, so you want to just get the mileage and climb as much as you can. Then you'll hit a grading scale, um, about four, uh, about V5 or V6. And that's when you have to start training is what I found. You want to start um, opposing just your pulling muscles. A lot of climbers will overwork their pulling muscles. And so they start to develop the climber hunch like this, like you can see here. I have a very uh, kind of almost deformed back from because of how much larger those muscles are. But you want to start training 
so that you can even out the muscles, your pushing muscles as well, and that gives you a more rounded, uh, more rounded um, musculature, so you can do different kinds of problems and harder problems. Um, so I would say get to about V5 just by climbing as much as you can, and then find someone at your local gym. They're probably very nice, and ask them about tips for training, uh, whether that be on the pull-up bar. Um, you know, uh, and different handholds and stuff like that, even weights. Weights help a lot. You start lifting. Um, that would be my advice. The science of rock climbing is complicated. I have been injured. I think about, uh, I think about how my body responds to it. I've, I've, put a lot, I've put a lot of force on very, very tiny muscles and tendons in my hands, which I've given out before, which we can go into later. Um, but I, I like to think about it physics-wise. And when I'm climbing, I really like to think of, so um, there's this thing in physics called a free body diagram, and it's basically your, int your entry point into all physical calculations. Um, and a free body diagram is just, let's just think about all of the forces on the object at play at any one time. What are their angles? What are, what, are, what, are, what are the components of these forces? How do you become balanced on the wall or, or what have you? And so this is me. Then you think of all the forces on you at any, at any one time. So when I'm on the wall, I like to think of, OK, well, if I need to go this way, how should I orient my leg? Should I bring my leg back and behind me to balance out my center of mass so I'm not putting too much torque on my hands. Um, think about your body like a free body diagram when you're climbing and I think eventually you will get a lot more fluid in your movements. When you're really, really good at rock climbing, you almost look like you're doing ballet up on the wall. Absolute control. And I think maybe that's what I like about it because I have absolute control in here and I like to extend that to other corners of my life. What's next? From Kojima Works. Hey Kyle. Kojima? Hey. Uh, Metal Gear Solid 5 was pretty good. Story is way too weird and misogynistic. Anyway, what's next? Uh, the, Kojima, what do you got? Are there any s scientific fact that you wish wasn't true? <laughs> wow, that's a, fun, that's a fun twist on it. Is, is, there any si is there any truth to the universe that I wish was untrue? Wow. Um, hmm. Well, one is, one is coming right to my head right now. I mean, it's kind of like a, a technicality, but um, it would be it would be interesting poetically, I guess. So, because of how electrons uh, repel each other, because they're like charges, they're both negative. Um, they want to force themselves apart, and everything uh, <laughs> this way. And everything, uh, your, your skin, everything you interact with, everything has atoms and everything has elect a cloud of electrons in an indiscriminate, uh, indeterminate positions floating around them. And so when you try to touch something, what's interacting is the repulsion between your electrons. So in some kind of philosophical way, you can kind of say that your atoms, if, if you are your atoms, and not your electrons, that you never really touch anything ever. And then you can extend that to kind of even uh, sadder philosophical musings like, have I ever touched my son? Or you know, have I ever kissed my loved one? Or something like that. And it's, <laughs> it starts to get kind of philosophically dangerous because you can get depressed. But uh, I, would, I would like it maybe that um, whatever, that, that, that what we considered ourselves more realigned with the scientific fact. So I'm kind of spinning the question a little bit, but I, but I, yes, okay, so, so this. I wish, I wish our intuitive physics, the, how we think things will happen just because of how we evolved and how our brains work, I, I wish our intuitive physics were more in line with actual physics and actual science. So we would, we would intuit that we're not actually touching anything and, and we would, um, we would feel how things would happen but without having to discover them or think through them and have all these misconceptions about the way the world really works. I wish that humans were better at understanding the world, but we're not, and that's why we need science. It just seems to be a really good way at checking our own biases and beliefs um, against some kind of standard that we come up with. So I don't know if that's an answer to your question, and now, my, now, I, and now I sound sad, but I'm not because What's next? From Data Bing. Oh, ho ho! Data Bing, baby! You can cut me off when I okay. do those, those parts. It's fine. They don't land. How could you tell the difference between a nuclear bomb 
detonation and an asteroid impact. One comes from the sky. Well, I mean, they both. OK. Um, uh, an asteroid impact. Hmm. Oh, oh, um, uh, kind of damage. You would be able to find. Um, so, so let, let's, let's consider ourselves uh, investigators. And we wanted to investigate a, uh, a site of some kind of detonation, explosion, impact, something like that. How would we determine if it was a nuclear bomb or a conventional bomb or a meteorite strike or something like that? Well, we would look for remnants of a nuclear weapon. We would look for um, particles that are only particular to nuclear detonations, like uh, radioactive fallout, for example. There is a lot of, not all material, not all the material in a nuclear bomb goes off. Not, not all of it undergoes fusion or fission. Uh, most of it is flung outwards, I think. Um, so you would look for those signatures and say like, okay, that was probably a nuclear weapon. For example, there's a wonderful piece in uh, the nuclear bulletin, nuclear science bulletin? Nuclear Bulletin. Anyway, you can find it online. That says, uh, just to just to clarify uh, this point, uh, that says that the total amount of nuclear material that uh, three body segments that uh, detonated that actually underwent some kind of nuclear process in the bombs that were dropped in Japan during World War II. The actual amount of material weighed less than a butterfly. Think about that. Think of, think of the bomb, little, little, uh, little boy and fat man. Think of the incredible amount of destruction that happened in those cities. Um, unconscionable destruction. All of that from the weight of a butterfly. And that's it. <laughs> that's why nuclear weapons are so scary. Anyway, you would look, <laughs> I keep getting dark, maybe it's me. Uh, you would look for the signatures of this kind of material, so uh, radioactive uh, elements and particles. We actually do this for a lot of things. Um, because of so much nuclear weapons testing uh, that was done in like the 1940s and 50s, um, we, can, we can still pick up traces of those bombs' material uh, in the atmosphere, in uh, paint, in wine, and we've used that timing for uh, dating some of these things. I think, maybe I'm, maybe I'm confusing the paintings and the wine, but I'm pretty sure uh, there have been scientists or uh, wine connoisseurs who have used uh, the, uh, the amount of radioactive elements in some wine bottles to determine if a wine was fake or not. So they say like, oh, this wine says it was bottled, uh, you know, before, like right around 1950 or whatever, because it's a great vintage, uh, but then they don't find any radioactive elements in it because it was bottled much, much later, or something like that. And so they can determine what is what is real and what is fake, or is way, be oh, no, it was probably, they say it was bottled before those nuclear tests, but then it has nuclear elements in it. And so it's like, well, no, it, it had to have happened after all that testing went on. Um, so that would be one way to determine the difference between a meteor, uh, a giant impact explosion like a meteor strike and a nuclear bomb. You would look for the uh, constituents of that bomb strewn about the landscape. Don't know why I said it like that, but that's, that's, what, that's, what, that's what you would investigate for. Uh, okay, yeah. Weight of a butterfly. Look at, look, look at that article. It's really well written. What's next? From Quantum Animus. Ooh, so... Cool sounding. I bet you wear a lot of leather jackets. What is your favorite celestial body? You know what? You know what? I'm gonna take some shots here. I think Pluto deserves to be evaluated as a pretty thing. You thought I was gonna say planet. No, Pluto can't be a planet because of definitions. But uh, you know, if we change those definitions, it could be a planet. It's kind of arbitrary what we define as planet. Anyway, Pluto. I, I think I, I was almost brought to tears, really, uh, when we got the first high-resolution pictures of Pluto. I think uh, growing up, if you're about my age, growing up, we always thought, at least con I always conceptualized Pluto as just kind of like this icy ball of nothing. It's probably gray, and who cares? It's so far out. But then when we got pictures of Pluto, it was, it, it was, it was absolutely... Uh, beautiful. It, it was this great big 
uh, it had it had beautiful reds. It had kind of I mean I'm exaggerating here of course, but it kind of had a big heart uh, made out of ice on its surface, and it was incredible looking. And I think it captivated the whole world for a while when we were getting these images back. So right now uh, Pluto's pretty cool, although I think. And some scientists that I know uh, think similarly, but once we get to uh, like uh, Europa or Enceladus or something, those might be the two best candidates to find some kind of life in the universe that is close to us. So those might be my future favorites, but right now, Pluto. Even if it's not a planet, it's absolutely beautiful. Yeah, Pluto's, uh, Pluto's more uh, beautiful than Uranus, I think. You thought I was going to make a joke. Didn't. What's next? From Favna. Who? Is it theoretically possible for all tectonic plates to cause earthquakes all at once? <laughs> what? Where do you guys get these questions? Seriously. Uh, is it possible for all the tectonic plates to cause all the earthquakes all at once? Don't know. You know I mean, is, is it possible to have like a global quake? I, I, I don't think so. I mean, it, I don't know, I'm not a geologist, but the timelines on major earthquakes extend uh, for like every you know, 10,000 years or 100,000 years you expect a giant earthquake. So for all of the fault lines to have a giant earthquake, think of all the opportunities they have to sync up their cycles, so to speak. And that's a myth, I know what you're thinking. It just is. We can get it, we don't have to get into that. It is a myth though. Uh, so think of, think of how many opportunities those earthquakes have to sync up if they're happening once every 10,000 years or 100,000 years. It could take uh, tens of millions of hundreds of millions of years before they all happened simultaneously by chance. So I think the chances of them uh, having like a global quake all at once are very, 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 very small. But I don't know. I'm not a geologist, but that would be my guess. What's next? From Jab412. Woo! Could you left or the right? I'm a right. And a left. And I write with my left, and sometimes my right. I write with it. Could you cook a steak by <laughs> dropping it from a super high height? OK, so could you cook a steak from dropping it from a super high height? I, I don't know if you're challenging me on this, uh, but I believe you are asking me to do exactly what XKCD already did. Otherwise, you're very randomly saying the exact same thing. So I'm going to defer um, to one of my favorite science books of the last few years, uh, which is What If? Uh, by Randall Monroe, the creator of XKCD. You should pick up What If and read it because it is like the, the pure physics um, and engineering version of Because Science um, where he's so much smarter than me too, which helps. But uh, his book, What If, based on the blog, it has fascinating and very weird and fun uh, questions just like that. Could you drop a steak from orbit and would it cook? And he goes through that entire analysis, analysis that I couldn't do here off the top of my head. So pick up What If by Randall Monroe. It is really, really good. Uh, it, has other, it has other stuff in it that he said he would not cover because it was too weird. And one of them was, how fast would you have to run at a cheese wire to cut yourself in half? I don't know. I'll look into it. What's next? From Bugman Bob. Oh, you better have a lot of bugs. Like that. Never mind. How much more space junk can we put into space Ooh. before we can no longer leave the planet safely? Ooh, yeah, I mean, I, I've spoken about what you were referring to before and uh, on, on this channel. And uh, it, is, it is called, as you may know, uh, it's called Kessler syndrome. So if we had. Let me just circle this. It's an oblate spheroid, it's fine. So uh, if you had the Earth and you surrounded it with enough uh, space junk here, like that, that's a little bit there. You surround it with enough space junk, there will be a point at which there will be so much space junk traveling at incredible velocity. Orbital velocity is orbiting the planet. So it's going kilometers per second. There'll be a point where there's too much so that you cannot escape the atmosphere without being hit by one of these things. And this is like being hit by a hypervelocity bullet. Um, it would obliterate you. Um, 
I do not know what that point is. I do not know how close we are to that point. Are we at you know, 10% of capacity? Are we at 99% capacity? No idea. But I do know that it is enough of a problem that industry is gearing up to try to deal with it with a number of different solutions, from nets to harpoons to that kind of thing. Um, so I do not know how close we are to Kessler syndrome, if you want to look that up. Um, but it's definitely a major worry right now. Uh, so. You have to do further reading. Sorry. What's next? From JRPH. Woo! If you were to go on a scientific expedition, where would you want to go? A scientific expedition. Um, I, uh, when I was growing up, I was, uh, kids called me the bug kid, kind of like the last commenter. Uh, kids call me the bug kid because I spent a lot of time in the backyard and in ponds and, and stuff and in, in the woods behind my house. I spent a lot of time catching bugs and looking at them and observing them and stuff. People call me the bug kid. So if I had, uh, if, if money and time and, you know, being trapped in here was no issue, then I would love to go to a place with an incredible density of exotic insects and stuff like that. Maybe like the Amazon or Peru um, to see some of these amazing spiders and centipedes and stuff. Um, but not the hair like centipedes, those gross me out. Um, so I, I would love to do that and kind of go on like this. Um, I would love to recapitulate the kinds of naturalist missions that like Darwin went on, where you could just, I know it wasn't just like this, but in my head it is, where you just go on a boat and draw birds. Just like, hmm. <laughs> Day 47, I saw a very pretty bird and I drew it very well. Here you go. You know, I would, I, would love, I would love for my life to just be uh, capturing the low-hanging fruit of biology. Like, <laughs> discovered a new turtle today, had a cool shell, and then I drew it, and that was it. I would, and they took it back to the queen, or whatever they did back then. Uh, I, I would love to do something like that. Or, or I would, uh, I, I, I really want to go uh, on the vomit comet. I know it's not really a scientific expedition, but it would be for me. I would love to do that. Is that a... One more question. One more? Oh, good. I thought I was done. From fell, from fell and Fair. Okay. Why do you age differently in space? You... Okay. So, um, maybe there's a confusion of concepts here. So, you can age differently in space. Um, there's two ways to do that that you've seen in pop culture. One is by gravitational time dilation. Well... Sure. One is by gravitational time dilation. You've seen this in movies like Interstellar. If you are by a very large mass, if you are close to that uh, very large mass, then time, your biological clock, your actual clock, um, will tick more slowly than uh, it does for other people. So you will age less than other people around you. Another way to do that same effect is to travel really, 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 really fast, which you can do in space. And it's easier to do in space because there's no air resistance in space. Um, but there is, you know, like, Photon pressure, whatever. So, but you don't have to just be in space to age differently. Um, you you age differently whenever you travel at speed. When it, whenever it, when you get on an airplane, you are tra you are traveling some velocity, and even though it is an incredibly incredibly tiny amount, for all intents and purposes, we would say it's zero. But it is some non-zero amount technically. So when you get in a plane, you are aging a little bit slower because you're traveling at speed. And when you get near anything with mass, say, uh, visit the pyramids, stand near the base of the pyramid, and you are aging just a little bit less. On any calculator that you could buy, there would be so many zeros that you couldn't, uh, couldn't see just how much less you were aging. But technically, you would be. And I like to think of that technicality uh, going back to uh, you know, the repulsion thing. I like to think of that technicality kind of in a romantic, uh, poetic way, which is um, you know, when you, as a consequence of this gravitational time dilation, when you feel like time is moving more slowly uh, when you're with the person that you love the most, it is for you two. And I think that's kind of wonderful. And accurate. So thank you so much for joining me for another edition of Because Science Live. Woo! Almost to the end of the year. Um, don't worry, um, though I will not be doing all the live streams until the end of the year. There's still holidays here in the void. It gets so cold. I will not be doing all the live streams through the end of the year. Uh, I think the last two weeks of the year? Yeah. Is that, is that correct? Next week is our last live 
for the year. Next week is our last live stream for the year, so join me for that. But we will be doing uh, both footnotes and main episodes of Because Science all the way through the holidays, even on Christmas and New Year's. Fun! So join me for that and join me next week for another new episode, another episode of Footnotes where I take your comments and questions from commenters just like you and the last live stream of the year. Have a, what day is it? What year is it? Right. Have a wonderful weekend and uh, be nice to each other um, because even though you might not technically ever touch another person <laughs> because of electrons, you still need to interact with them in a way that doesn't repel them all the time. Be nice to each other. This is all we got.